I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Catherine Higley from Oregon State University, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, she's professor and head of the Oregon State University School of Nuclear Science and Engineering. She's a council member for NCRP. She chairs the ICRP Committee 5 on Environment. She's a fellow member of the Health Physics Society and a certified health physicist. And she held reactor and senior reactor operator's license and former reactor supervisor for the Reed College Trigger Reactor. Welcome, Kathy. Her topic is education or training. Does it matter? Thank you very much. Well, I'm uh, very, very happy to be here. Um, it's a little difficult when you sit through the morning session and you see some of your slides or the content of your slides show up on the previous speaker. So I'm, I'm going to wing some of this. Um, and we'll first off, there we go, we can run it. So why are we even, why are we even talking about education versus training? Why does, it, why does it matter? And you've seen this graph in some form or another. Uh, basically, in higher education at the, at the uh, undergraduate and graduate levels, the number of students in health physics programs has been dropping uh, precipitously for a number of years now, and so it puts us in a, in a little bit of a bind. You know, one of the conversations I have with some folks in industry is, well, you know, if you believe in market forces, the decline in, in health physics uh, students, you know, it's not a big deal. If we need more health physicists, the market will provide, we'll educate them, we'll get them out, and uh, we don't have to worry about having sufficient, sufficient capacity. The, the system will take care of itself. And I want to spend a couple of minutes, I, I, I want to explore this issue about where new health physicists sort of magically come from, because I don't know if you've ever had this kind of birds and bees talk, um, you know, with your mentor to, to you. So I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes and talk about this. So as you've seen the discussion this morning, um, health physics I guess you could say really is a, is a diffuse and pretty ill-defined field. I mean, we could have a knockdown drag out with the radiation biologist or the, the medical um, health, physicist, health physics people or those that are in accelerators. And so it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty diffuse group. There are many different specializations that can get lumped into maybe not health physics, maybe as Kathy Pryor said, we should rename ourselves radiation protection or something really fancy. But um, you know, you have radiation safety, you have internal dosimetry, you have radiation biology, there's, there's radiochemistry and environmental and, and all these different areas that can be part of a, a well-rounded health physicist education. If you look at ac academic setting, um, people come into health physics through links with a number of different disciplines. So there may be programs in public health and industrial hygiene, in nuclear engineering, uh, or there may be standalone health physics programs. So we have ties to, to many, many different academic disciplines, which again makes us sort of a diffuse thing that's hard to define and hard to really uh, explain. And the good thing, again, a well-rounded health physicist, a student can be educated in some or all of these, and, and I would claim that really robust programs introduce students to all of these concepts from internal dosimetry, radiation biology, shielding, environmental, and, and more. I mean, I think, to, to my mind, as an academic, this is the hallmark of a, of a, a good, strong health physicist. And I'd also say that if the student has a robust education, then they can move between any of these specializations if their employer's need evolves or if they choose to change employers because they're very versatile. They are, they are um, oftentimes in engineering, we talk about a T-shaped engineer. So somebody who's got a strong fundamentals and a wide swath of capabilities. And I think that's kind of what health physicists are. They will have a really strong core, but then a wide area that they can tap into and they can use to move from, from need to need. So the problem comes when you don't have a health physicist and you need to hire somebody and you don't have anybody with this broad education, but you still need a health physicist. Well, wh what do you do? 
So again, many disciplines overlap health physics. I'm in a school of nuclear science and engineering. Some of my best friends, well, not really, are nuclear engineers. <laughs> Um, and so let's take, for example, shielding. That's a, that's a hallmark of what a lot of nuclear engineering students do. So you could be confronted with a nuclear engineer, and I'm not insulting some of you that are nuclear engineers, Bruce Napier and Bill Kennedy, um, but again, they have this experience, and so the thought is, you know, can you take somebody with a health physics-like education and turn them into a health physicist? Is, is training the answer? And I, I'm gonna, in a little bit, make a distinction between what used to be and what is now. But is training the answer to get you what you need? So training in and of itself gives very specific knowledge and skills within a defined framework. And so you are trained to work within certain parameters. And that's really good and you can be very effective at what you're doing. The problem is, as you get further and further away from your core knowledge, you know, those skills are less adaptable, they're less robust, they're less secure, and you wind up with the chance that somebody's gonna be operating way outside of their skill set, but still claiming expertise and knowledge. And it's something you need to be very, very cautious and cognizant about. So my point is that training may, and there are some wonderful examples where, where people are, are doing great, but will likely not fill this need for well-rounded, knowledgeable health physicists. And it's most important when things go wrong. 99.999% of the time, you don't need somebody with a diverse skill set because the day-to-day -day operations, nothing changes. It's, with, it's when something does change that you start to have problems. So what can be done? So I wanna go back and talk about health physics academic programs. We've already seen Enrollments are declining. We saw a discussion about you know, higher ed funding is plummeting. Um, tuition is being raised. The little thing we didn't talk about is that while legislatures are paying less for higher ed, they're also controlling tuition costs. So universities are turning to fundraising. They also have to balance new demands from their legislature, increasing student enrollment, advanced retention goals more uh, first-generation students, so they have to make tough decisions. What investments are essential? What can we cut? And the question is, where do small programs fit? If you look at, we saw this data on health physics programs, we are, we're graduating five students per program per year in undergraduate, or a couple students in the, in the PhD realm. And there's no money for research for, for health physics programs. So in, in academia, this is simply not sustainable. Higher education is moving to a return on investment model. Health physics education, either at the undergraduate or the graduate level, does not fit within that model. It is not financially sustainable. Okay. So what are our options? Um, we can collaborate, evolve, or perish. We can share courses. Uh, we can look at maybe joint degrees. We can think about pooling curriculum, and there are some examples out there. The problem is that um, autonomy, which is the hallmark of higher education and faculty, um, they don't necessarily like to collaborate or, or compromise. And so we have to move forward in a way that, that a lot of faculty members don't particularly want to do. Can we create research leagues for academic institutions? Okay. So enough about academia. What about other organizations, radiation protection societies? Can they play a role? The Health Physics Society, ABHP, I think that they could marshal or help marshal uh, support for institutions. I learned that we can't lobby, HPS can't lobby, but maybe they could inform regulators. They can give feedback to academic programs on what core competencies really are for health physicists. And maybe instead of using ABET, they could come up with an accreditation program because ABET is extremely expensive for small programs to, to uh, deal with. What about federal agencies? How can they help? I'm gonna digress again for just a second. So again, picking on nuclear engineers versus health physicists. If you wanna hire one through the federal system, you look at the Office of Personnel Management classifications and qualifications for jobs. And if you go to nuclear engineering, it says, no, 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 go look at an engineer, so it turns you to another page. And if you go to health physicist, it gives you some specifics. I don't expect you to read this, but the, but the page for the nuclear engineering qualifications is like this long, 
and it, and it has uh, graduation from an ABET accredited program or a PE or an EIT, a bunch of calculus, some other stuff. And if you look at health physicist, it says uh, you have to have 30 hours of science credits and maybe some health physics in there somewhere. And that's what is a health physicist according to OPM. And I think, again, that's a recipe for disaster. So recommendations to federal agencies is I think you need to take a hard look at what those OPM classifications and qualifications are and maybe put them more in line with engineering professions. Some sort of minimum credit hours, some coursework, approved academic programs, and then take a look at what positions you're trying to fill and maybe mandate advanced degrees and certifications for these jobs that have substantial radiation safety management or assessment responsibility. And the other thing, the important thing, is that federal programs that have substantial radiation safety obligations, I'm talking DOE and uh, NRC and EPA and a whole bunch of DHS and others must carve out funds for academic research specifically for health physics. Okay. Other organizations, industry, I'll, I'll pick on info, INPO for a minute, you know, their, their intent is to provide the highest levels of safety and reliability. I think INPO and the nuclear industry must take a hard look again at who they are hiring into their health physics professions. They have NRRPT certification for technicians. You need to make sure, maybe not necessarily certified health physicists, but certainly your health physicists have a, have a broad and deep uh, education that allows them to deal with uncertain issues. They also, um, as was mentioned earlier, we need to have more opportunities for internships, partnering with academic institutions, encouraging faculty experience, all part of this knowledge transfer experience that makes both the educators and the students and the industry kind of improve to, together. So what, what's the future? You know, with, without some specific action, health physics, radiation protection uh, as a discipline is going to be relegated to a subspecialty footnote within other academic programs, if it survives at all. This, this broad interdisciplinary education that really is the hallmark of a great health physicist will be lost. You know, training, training can help, um, but it is not sufficient. And if you rely too much on people that are cross-trained without that depth, I think that you are, you are setting yourselves up in the long run for, for issues. Now, I think part of this, you know, we're a victim of our own success. We've been really good uh, in minimizing accidents, in controlling doses, and so there's no obvious pressing need for health physicists to be able to respond to things because we're, we're doing pretty good. But the issue is when things don't work well or by virtue of having people that aren't quite qualified in a job, suddenly things stop working well, you really are going to need the health physicists. So I've probably alienated and annoyed most of my colleagues in, in the audience by saying, you know, training is not sufficient and picking on Bruce and, and Bill Kennedy. I would, I would say that, you know, for a really long time, the entryway into health physics was through all of these different disciplines. Through, I mean, I started as a chemist, as a radio chemist, as an undergraduate when I became a health physicist. They came in through nuclear engineering. They came in through industrial hygiene. But the difference was 20 years ago or 30 years ago, I'm showing my age, um, that there was a really robust community of mentorship where the people that had been in the trenches that had evolved with the discipline spent a lot of time working with the younger staff coming in and really not training them but educating them on the specifics of, of health physics and what it meant. Uh, and I would say that that community now is really fragmented. Employers are very reluctant to send employees to health physics meetings or travel in general uh, because they're looking at the, at the bottom line. And so that vibrant learning experience that used to exist where, again, people like Bruce and Bill and others could come in and just absolutely dominate the field because of their, ex their experience, their expertise, their learning, those kind of opportunities are, are, are going away, and I think we're all the, the poorer for it. So the point is, I mean, there are a number of these niche 
uh, knowledge specializations that are, that are at risk. You know, we've seen some of these reports about nuclear and radiochemistry and radiochemistry education and health physics and nuclear forensics, and it all, it can be tied into this rush to return on investment and, you know, it's a budget-driven model and we don't need these people right now, so when we need them, they're miraculously going to appear fully formed out of the ether, and, and that's, a, that's a big, it's a big concern. We also have policies that need to get made or adapted or involved. Okay, I'm a certified health physicist. I've been, and I'm educated in health physics through Colorado State. I've had rad bio and I've had all manner of dosimetry and, and I've read a number of NCRP and ICR documents. And my brain still kind of seizes up a little bit when I start getting into the weeds in some of our, our dose calculations or our dosimetry systems or our radiation protection guidance. And if I sign up, kind of struggle with that, I have to imagine somebody that hasn't spent any time in the discipline is probably going to run away in the corner and, I don't know, collapse in a, in a heap. And so you need to really think about how important people with this experience are to safety, security, and policy. So the solutions I've kind of talked about, and I've, I've used these terms before, cooperation and cash. Academic programs have got to cooperate or they're with each other or they're going to go away. Uh, in industry and government have to support these academic programs. Scholarships and fellowships are nice, but if I want to be able to hire a new professor in health physics, I have to be able to show there is sustained research funding for that person to have any chance of success at tenure. That's, a, that's the bottom line in academic programs, and it's not a $20,000 a year grant. We're talking $300,000, $500,000 a year for a faculty member to be able to get tenure. So recognition and respect. I think that we need to say that there are certain things that should be outside a budget model. And I believe that health physics, you could argue radiobiology, certain others are an area of strategic national need. We simply can't afford to let these things go away. I think that we also have to look at regulation and retention. You need to reclassify what constitutes a health physicist and force a sort of tightening of the rules. You need to broaden the coursework requirements for somebody to be able to call themselves a health physicist. And I think NRC, DOE, and others need to mandate stricter education and licensure for certain jobs. I think that's just essential. So in, in conclusion, I think that there are specific steps that are necessary if you want to keep health physics as a standalone academic discipline. I think it represents a strategic national need. It is very much in peril. Talk to the academics. You've already heard some of that today, but the other academics in the audience. There's no single action that is going to solve this problem. There's a lot of things that need to be done. Cooperation in cash, recognition and respect, regulation and retention. And before I finish, I want to acknowledge, as I said, I came into health physics initially through chemistry radiochemistry, and I was exposed to the field through Ron Catherine, who some of you may know, um, was a health physicist for Portland General Electric at the Trojan Nuclear Plant. And then I was mentored when I went to, to Pacific Northwest National Lab by gentlemen like Jack Corley, Joe Soldat, Gene Schreckheis, when I went on to grad school, Ward Wicker. They helped shape me and give me the information that I needed, and Tom Borak, if he's in the audience somewhere, he still scares me because of the tests that he used to give me. I swear to God, I see him and I think about the tests I took from that man. And then I, ha and then I have other colleagues, Bruce Napier, Bill Kennedy, Dan Strom, John Boyce. These, this community really helps make us better and stronger. So thank you very much for the time. Thank you.